do it yourself because no one is going to like care about your business as much as you do. And you know, when it's your idea and your passion, that is something you can't transfer or share. It just isn't. Hi guys, and welcome back to the Mind Body Planet podcast. We are back for another week. And if you're watching, yes, it is nighttime now. That is finally when I have a chance to record the intro and outro. So get ready for a jump scare because it gets much brighter if you're watching. Today, we are talking with Kate Asaraf, who is the founder of Dip, a sustainable and plastic-free shampoo and conditioner bar brand. For me personally, I have been using these bars for over a year, and I freaking love them, but I also freaking love Kate. She has tons of experience in the beauty industry, and hair care is truly her passion. Today's conversation is really motivating and inspiring as she's built her brand pretty much on her own with the help of her husband who did a lot of the marketing and graphic design. So today we're going to be talking about how she built her beauty brand pretty much from scratch, um, the shift in the UGC and influencer content creation space, advice for someone out there who may be inspired to take a similar career path. And we even touch on a little bit of misinformation in the fragrance space and really just in like the clean ingredient space too. Kate is truly such a wonderful human with so much knowledge and wisdom to share. So I am freaking pumped for this episode. I think you're going to love it. So let's get into it. Hi, Kate. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being on today. Hello. Thanks for having me. For people who don't know, Kate and I actually, well, I guess we virtually know each other. We met um, a kind of a crazy experience, really. I saw her on social media, or I guess her brand, Dip, which we'll talk about in a minute here. And I love the product and I ordered it and was like, I love the packaging, love the branding. Like I got to try this thing, fell in love with it, posted the video. The video went like mega viral. And it was insane. It was just like super crazy. <laughs> like who would have thunk? And then Kate reached out to me and was absolutely the sweetest and was like, thank you so much for posting that. And uh, ever since like, the rest is history. Like now we're kind of friends, I'd say. Like, yeah. Internet friends. <laughs> I do. I, re I remember calling you after that, after that video. First I got your number and then I called you and I remember like every moment because we had spoken a few times and I remember when it first started to go viral, I was in my backyard talking to you. And then another time I was like on the beach talking to you and we we're like, it's just, <laughs> it's going crazy. Um, and that was a really fun experience. And that that's our meet cute. That's our little thing that how we became friends. <laughs> yes, it is a meet cute. It is, isn't it? <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you again for being on the podcast. Let's get into our favorite things of the week. Would you like to go first or would you like for me to go first? Mm, I'll go first and then okay. we'll, we'll go one, 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 right? Oh, okay. okay. I love it. Let's do it. Perfect. Okay. So my favorite thing right now is um, the new issue of Whalebone. Um, it's the only place Dip advertises. And the reason it's my favorite, first of all, it's like highlights for adults. It's like a really fun magazine and like silly and weird. Um, but I have... Like the, the thing that I am so passionate about is um, refill stores. And we ran an ad in here that has really nothing to do with dip and everything to do with a celebration of refill stores. And basically um, it says refill is the new record store. And so I spent my, my ad money in here um, basically saying, if you want to go, if you want to talk real sustainability, go to a refill store. And like, that's where the change makers are. And that's where you find out what is cool. Um, and sustainability. And I know refill stores need our help more than anything right now. And so this was like a passion project that Whalebone agreed to let me put in there. And I'm like, so excited. So that's one of my favorite things ever. <laughs> oh, I love that. For those that aren't watching, the ad is so cool. It's like a monochromatic green and it's like a record coming out of like a dip kind of container package almost. Yeah. And um, yeah, I love that so much. Refilleries are definitely, they're on the, the rise. I feel like even like pre-pandemic, I feel like I, I'd never heard of that before. And now, mm -hmm. now I have one finally in San Antonio. I've been waiting for one. I thought I was going to have to open it. I was like, man, like, <laughs> I wish I had one. Okay, so my favorite thing, I've, I've definitely talked about it before on the podcast, but I'm a sucker for like trash reality television. It's like <laughs> what brings me joy is how I relax. And Love <laughs> Island UK is now filming and you can watch it on Hulu. I think it's like a week or two after it actually airs in the UK. So spoilers are rampant. You can't really, you know, avoid the spoilers because it's already been out for a while. But I love it. It's just like... It's <laughs> 
dating show, really, of just a bunch of young people. And what's sad is like, when I first started watching the show, I was like, oh, these people are a lot older than me. And now they're my age and some are younger than me. And I'm like, this is weird. <laughs> beware it's it's weird I just went to for the first time I went to a doctor that was younger than me and it felt so weird like (laughs) um, it's it was really really messing with me a little bit but you know it's super impressive and it's also you know life does move on so you do like age out of it like it's it's strange yeah it's so weird like in my mind like I still feel like I'm like 17 years old and then obviously I'm not 17 anymore I'm 25 (laughs) so I'm like wow like time does go on it's pretty crazy you kind of feel like it never does and then all of a sudden you're like wow so much has happened in the last five years I'm turning 40 in a a few weeks July 7th I'll be 40 and um I still feel like an 18 year old in my head so I don't know if it, I don't know if you ever age out of that or whether, or whether it's just like, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm a cancer. Are you a cancer by any chance? No, I'm an Aquarius. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but not everyone feels this way though. What? Like, really? I, I often bring this up with my friends and especially when I see, cause I, I'm still close with a lot of people I grew up with and I have some of the same friends since kindergarten. And like, I'm like, don't you feel like still, you know, 18 in your head? And they're like, no, what are you talking about? <laughs> Oh. oh my gosh. Well, <laughs> I would rather feel younger because I like, I love like, oh, this sounds kind of weird, but like, I love to play. Like, does that make sense? Like, I love to just like do things that are weird and like maybe somebody else my age wouldn't do like, you know, do a cartwheel <laughs> in the middle of a parking lot. Like that's totally me. <laughs> and I love it. Cause it's like, if you don't like have fun in your day to day life, like you're missing out, like you gotta yeah. make life fun. Fun won't just like fall into your lap. You gotta make it fun. So I 100% agree with that. And actually, it's my biggest argument for when people like, you know, don't know whether they want to have kids or not. My favorite thing about having kids and they're five and seven is that everything becomes like everything that you took for granted becomes magical again, like snow, playing in the rain, like jumping in puddles, like a fla- I remember the first time my son touched a flower and was like so excited about it as a baby. And like those little moments are become so you like, you're like, Oh my God, I went through the, like the end of my twenties. I, I fell out of play and like you come back into it and it's a really, it's a really cool feeling. Oh, I love that. It sounds like so magical. Yeah. It, it is a little magical. I can you know, I sometimes like, cause in my head, I'm still 18. I forget when I'm like, I forget, I live two lives, right? I have this like business life where I do things like this and I'm not in mom mode. And then I go into like another zone of my brain and I do this thing. So like when I'm talking to you, I forget that I'm like a parent. It's a, it's a strange <laughs> thing. And if I think in my head, I'm like your age. And I'm not I'm like it's this other, other life. It's this weird thing. Yeah. I love it though. It's like, you don't, some people I feel like you know, become a parent or have like something happen in their life and it becomes their entire personality and yeah. it becomes really difficult to connect with people who aren't in that same space of life. And, you know, I'm guilty. I've definitely done that too, but I've noticed the more like open-minded, the more things that you try that are new and different, the more you're mm-hmm. able to connect with people on a better level. You got to dip yeah. into everything a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <Justin, yes. laughs> um, okay. You said you had a second favorite thing. Okay. This is, I went um, to Wildwood, New Jersey. I took my kids to the beach for a week last week and it rained the whole time. So we had to find other things to do. And the first time in my life, I'd only seen this in movies. I went into a mirror maze. Have you ever been into a carnival mirror maze? I've only seen them in like murder movies, but they're so (laughs) fun. (laughs) I had so much fun. (laughs) It was the, probably one of the most fun things we did when we were there. And we spent so much time in there. We were all getting lost. And uh, it was great. I loved that's, it so much. That's so cool. I love that. <laughs> I have been in one. Where, where where did I go in one? I went in one. <laughs> I think it was some, like, interactive, like, kind of art museum that they, like, have, like, you know, they kind of rotate from city to city. Mm-hmm. And we had one in town. And I went. And I think it was a mirror one. But it was almost like glass. Like I felt like I could see huh. through, but I couldn't see through. But maybe, oh. so maybe no, it was not this mirror, one. Maybe it was glass. I don't know. <laughs> it was <just> scary. <laughs> it was re- it was really really fun though. Um, and I didn't. I guess they're like hard to come by because I've ne- I've gone like almost forty years and have never encountered one. Too many murder mystery movies. Yeah, they're saving them all for the murder. 
There's always someone cleaning up blood. (laughs) They're always closed. (laughs) Uh, My last favorite thing, um, I have become quite the bookworm. I used to think reading was like only like business books and like self-help and that kind of stuff. And uh, like lately I've been reintroduced to fantasy and like fiction books and romance books. And there's (laughs) one that I'm reading right now. It's called Crescent City. It's by Sarah J. Moss. And she has another like super like, I guess, kind of viral series out right now called ACOTAR. I don't know if you've heard of it before. Ooh, no. Uh-uh. It stands for A Court of Thorns and Roses. And I read all six books in the series. Some people even compare it to like the next kind of Harry Potter type series. Oh, cool. And yeah. And the series was so good. I mean, like I could not put it down. I went, I read all six books in I think a span of like six months, which was like, oh my gosh. Of. Like I literally (laughs) stopped watching movies. I stopped watching TV and I just read. That was like what I did. (laughs) That's awesome. So I started her second series that I guess is her newest one called Crescent City. So I'm on the first book of that one. And it's also really good. Mm -hmm. This series has modern technology and like Hmm. drugs, which is interesting to read. Oh, weird. A fantasy of like vampires and werewolves and stuff. And then also like (laughs) drugs. And I'm like, oh, okay, well. (laughs) But it's good so far. So please, Kate, introduce yourself. And I would love to also hear a little bit about your journey with sustainability. Okay. So my name is Kate Asaraf, and I am the CEO and founder of DIP, although you won't ever see me call myself a CEO outside of this. It's just, it's, uh, it's always, it always feels strange to call yourself a CEO. Um, when you're, when you have a very small company, it almost seems like silly, but I put that sometimes on my emails cause that's the way I get people to write back to me. Um, but other than that, I am, uh, the founder, which is more comfortable of dip. Um, I run it, I ran it solo for the first 18 months completely by myself. And, um, we've just expanded now. My husband has joined the team. Um, and, uh, we have Joanne has just joined as our shipping manager. So it's a small, small team of three doing all of this magic. Um, we sell shampoo and conditioner bars and the whole story behind dip is that, I want to take people away from luxury hair care. Every, you know, it it brings me no joy to take a customer away from a happy bar customer user, but there's tons of people that swear by Orbe, Pureology, Olaplex, Kerastase, Whey, like all these bottled fast to consume brands. And I myself am a customer of those brands for forever. And so I built Dip to make sure that I could, you know, seduce people away (laughs) from fast to consume salon bottled brands. Um, so that that's what dip is. It's but I spent a long time, long, long time developing them. Um, they're the only, we now manufacture, um, ourselves. So, um, that formula isn't shared among a million other brands, how it kind of is in the beauty industry. And, and it is my passion project. Like making a great conditioner bar was my passion project. I, I hear what you're saying with the luxury, like hair care brands, because Mm -hmm. you're right. They don't offer anything that's really sustainable. I don't really see any of them like market anything about how they're being more eco-friendly. The only thing that I have seen are refills that come in kind Mm -hmm. of like those big pouches, but it's still plastic. It's it's still, you know, trash at the end of the day anyways. So sometimes I'm like, well, I guess it's better, but it's not great, you know? So I I love that, that your goal was really luxury in bar form. Yeah. And, and to develop them, I took it like really seriously. I, um, I basically did these half head showers during development. So every time a new iteration of the formula would come through, I would do half a head of Pureology, half a head of dip, what the sample, half a head of Oribe, half a head dip. And then I would go Kerastase, Way, Kevin Murphy, like all, I did half head tests on, on almost every luxury brand, um, And then what I would do is I would like set a timer for drying, for dry down of each. And I would like blow dry the same amount of time on both sides of my head and compare. And then I, it was like kind of like mad scientist stuff happening, but at like a very silly level with hair step. But because I love hair so much, it was like easy for me to do because it was, it was fun. It was like, you know, this has like a tack to it. I want whatever ingredient is providing that tack that is like a little bit of a stick. I don't want that, you know, and, and we would adjust, adjust, adjust until I found that my, my bars were better because I'm the customer, right? Like I know, I know exactly what I wanted my bars to do. 
and I knew exactly what I wanted them to not do. And so once I got what was perfect for my own hair, then I sheepishly put them out to every curly headed person I knew that had like type three and type four curls. And I was like, all right, put it through the ringer, tell me what you hate about it. And then I took their feedback and, you know, reorganized and went through all the ingredients with a comb and like, just, just fix that. And then I took it to my surf friends and I was like, okay, the biggest thing is like, I always bring conditioner to the beach. I've been doing that since I was 11 because I hate tangly hair after I get out of the ocean and especially after I wipe out when surfing because I'm terrible. And I'm like, I need this because liquid conditioner like separates in the sun if it gets too hot. So I needed this to withstand the heat of the sun if you brought it to the beach and to detangle hair. So I did this like whole thing with all the surfers I knew. I was like, just put it through the ringer and like every single time the feedback came and made it better and better and better. And then I took it a step further and I made my hair very, very blonde and damaged. Um, and then I tested it all on that because I wanted to be able to say like, this is how it performs after this much time. And I didn't on super damaged hair. Cause I didn't want to take the thing about like getting people's feedback is everyone always tells you that it's good, but like I needed to know for myself. And then I made my hair pink after it was blonde and I tested the, the, cause pink is really hard to keep in your hair, like red hair dye. And I made sure that the shampoo was really gentle and, and, barely took the color out. So, um, and it was so good at not taking the color out that I had to do like, a, cause I didn't I feel too old to have pink hair personally. Like you need to wear, I never wear makeup, but I think with pink hair, sometimes you just like need makeup to make, finish the look. So mm-hmm. it got to the point where I had to, had to take like baking soda and shampoo and shampoo and like scrub the pink out of my hair, like DIY style, <laughs> just, to, <laughs> just to get rid of the pink. Um, but that's, that's like the story of dip and how it came to be. It's just someone who I'm just someone who loves hair so much and, and couldn't find the solution, um, for what I felt was my standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And really you only have like one formula, right? And it's just a Mm -hmm. different sense. So your one formula works for color treated hair, curly hair, straight hair, yeah, bleached hair, colored hair. I think I already said that, but you know, yeah. Well, the, there's two reasons for that. One is, um, I watched people buy shampoo for a very long time. I just sat and watched. And um, and what people do is they look at something, they unscrew the top, they smell it, and then they read it. That's the order of behavior. <laughs> and I know that because I do that. And then, but I saw everyone else doing that too. So I was like, okay, the scent is really, really important. Um, and then the other thing is, is that I, first of all, bar storage is its own problem. Like, dividing people or, or dividing consumers into different hair types doesn't work if you're a family with multiple hair types or a set of best friends. Like my best friend is mixed. She has uh, some parts of her hair are type three, some parts are type four curls, and we should be able to travel together and use the same hair care. You know, I don't think it, I don't, I, I have a big problem with a brand selling of all this different hair type stuff. And then like, a f- what's a family supposed to do? Are they supposed to buy like 10 racks? You yeah. know, how are they supposed to do this? How is that something that, that is helpful for, I don't know. I think in, in terms of family, because it, you look at a shower and there's like a million products to, to, for one family, but there are many families that have now just switched to dip and they just have our hair care. And it like makes me so happy because like they, they don't have to buy all this specific stuff anymore. Mm-hmm. In your experience, I'm just curious, um, when you were kind of formulating your bars, is there a reason that brands sell all of these different types for different hair types? Is there actually something behind that or is it really just marketing? I think it's marketing. Really? I think it's marketing. Think of, just think about how much, and this is for anyone listening, this is like really important. Just use your, your math brain here. Think about how much product is used per wash when it's a bar. It's very, very little. You can wash your hair with a bar and it barely looks used. Think about the difference between that and like a, a normal shampoo. It's a, the, the liquid shampoos behave a little bit differently. Those, those marketing ingredients that are in there, they behave a little differently when they're in a water-based formula, like a liquid shampoo or conditioner. But in a bar, I'm convinced that it's all about shelf space and shelf presence and selling more bars to like more people. Um, and you know, 
<laughs> they might come after me for this and be like, no, no, we have this ingredient that does it. And I'm like, but it doesn't, for, for what I know from using bars since 2014, I've been using these bars since 2014 and then secretly switching to my luxury stuff in between before I develop my own. Um, I know that the amount that you use per wash cannot satisfy the claims that these brands make about their bars. Mm. Like controls frizz. It's like what? What's con- what, the the tiny, tiny, tiniest bit that touched your hair? You think that that's like a big frizz controller over some other? I don't know. It it makes from what I know. I don't. I think it's all kind of snake oil. Yeah, I think that that is interesting. I my first job out of college was working adjacent, I guess, to a grocery store. And one of the big things that we would get is the suppliers, manufacturers, brands wanted multiple facings because the more Mm -hmm. facings you have on a shelf, the more likely you are to be seen. And if you're in like the middle of the shelf, you're at eye level versus if you're at the top or the bottom, less people are going to notice your brand. So if you really only have one formulation, that's only one facing. So yeah, you're right. I, that does make sense that you say that. And, and think about if you're selling to a family and one want the daughter has big curly hair, the dad has like tight, coily hair and the mom has like limp blonde hair like you're then you then that family could buy six bars mm-hmm. I mean that's yeah. just the way it is um so that's you know I, I, I like I'm not trying to dog on anyone too much but it, but it, from like it's very important to me that people learn to buy less and just consume less in general and it's also once you get the bars in your home you have to be able to like handle them and I just imagine you know, I'm a f- family four. Like if we all had different hair types, that would be eight bars in our shower. Like that's ridiculous. Yeah, definitely. So it sounds like you started really this journey because you had a passion for hair care and you realized there was a gap in the market and you're like, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to create what I want to see. Yeah. And, and the full picture is that I've been in beauty and my husband have, has been in beauty for almost 20 years, both of us. So there's that other layer where we had uh, you know, head start where we were knowledgeable and we have been behind the scenes in beauty for a very, very long time. So, so in that sense, like we didn't just decide one day, we, we had the resources. So I want people to know that, that we, you know, we came from like a, a step up, um, you know, it wasn't an idea we just came up with and like got into it because, you know, I don't want anyone to think that doing this is easy. It's like a very, very difficult undertaking. And we were, you know, we were able to fast track it because we had so many connections. Um, but I think it's, it's important, even though we bootstrapped this ourselves and we started when we were both like, you know, completely down and out. Um, it's important to know that we, that we had the connections to make it happen. Okay. So you had connections in the beauty industry from previous Mm -hmm. work and experience there. Yeah. Yeah. Both of us. I knew the regulations behind what you can put on the packaging I knew, you know, I, I knew like, and he, he knows that inside and out too. I also knew how to handle MOQs, like minimum order quantities when I'm talking to a manufacturer and was like all of those things. I, you know, I also, because I've been in beauty for a long time, I knew the standards that I wanted to build the bars to, which were Credo beauty standards, which are the strictest in the industry. Like, and same with the fragrance. Like I, I knew the fragrance house I wanted to use. Like, so, and I didn't have to do a lot of that, um, that really hard work in the beginning of figuring out because I, I had the toolkit was, has been built over the past like 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You brought up fragrance, which I want to talk about, but mm-hmm. before we, we navigate onto the fragrance topic, which I find really interesting with having the experience in the beauty industry beforehand, and then also creating this, did you find a lot of difficulty in creating something that was this luxury item or, you know, compared to luxury items, but also Mm -hmm. having environmental standards with ingredient sourcing and all that. Was that difficult? Uh, Yeah, mostly because, um, mostly because when you talk about sustainability in the beauty industry and this, you know, a few years ago, you get scoffed at, you get your eyes get rolled, right? Like they, like they're, you know, like, ugh, sustainability, because what people hear is like clean with you when, when you talk to a chemist, they hear like clean beauty and no toxins and all and no chemicals. And none of that is real talk. Like none of that means anything. So when they hear someone's trying to put out like an eco-friendly brand, there was like this big time in beauty where it was like, you should be able to pronounce all the chemicals like on the, on the, or all the ingredients on the back. And that doesn't, 
that's not helpful. That actually doesn't mean anything. And it's also like not a chemist's fault that you can't pronounce it, right? Like, mm-hmm. like there's real science that goes into hair care and there's real, real knowledge that that gets kind of booted out when someone talks about doing a sustainable brand. But that's not what I was trying to do. What I was trying to do is make a plastic free brand that really moved the needle on how much plastic was getting brought into the home. Um, mm-hmm. And so for me, like the clean beauty, which doesn't mean anything, didn't, wasn't part of the story and saying like non-toxic, like uh, m- there's really not a lot of toxic shampoos out there. Like, honestly, there's really not a lot of toxic shampoos out there. So that's like another thing that doesn't really have any weight when you're talking to a chemist. Maybe when you're talking to a consumer, it's different, right? And then chemical free is like another one that like blows my mind because everything is chemicals. Like the air we breathe is chemicals. Like the, the, the whole notion that it should be chemical free is like, I mean, it's like hilarious more than it is anything else. So, so in that sense, when, when people heard that, um, or when, you know, my industry, connections we're hearing that I want to do a sustainable brand there's like a, a bit of some eye rolling but there are moments in building the brand that are worth fighting for and sustainability is one of them making sure that this formula lasted a very long time really really like annoyed people right because they're like why would you want it to last a long time and I'm like I want it to last a long time because I think people should just learn to shop less that's it like that was my goal no plastic train people to buy less. And that's why the conditioner bar is so much bigger than the other ones on the market. That's why the shampoo bar is bigger than the other ones on the market by like a lot. You know, it's because I'm okay with selling less if you're excited about it. If it satisfies like um, saving someone money, like for, you know, my conditioner bar alone saves me personally $500 a year. Um, And someone with type four hair, it'll save them maybe like $200 a year. So like those were the things I really set out to do. This is why people, people, this is why it's important to talk to people who are experienced in an industry, because Mm -hmm. I think this is a good kind of segue into fragrance that we were just talking about. But so many times I think people hear people talk about these clean ingredients, even food, you know, clean foods, all of these things. But there's not a lot of stuff behind that other than like, I think the normal person who doesn't have any background or experience or education in it it's easy to believe, right? Like, Oh, well, if I can pronounce it like, yeah, of course that must be better for me. But (laughs) you know, I, that's why it's important to talk to people who do have the education and can share that with other people. Like, Hey, that's not actually the truth. Totally. And especially when it comes to rinse off products, I would be more careful with skincare that you're like leaving on your face for a very, very long time. Um, to the point of absorption, but rinse off products don't, they're, they're, there's not a lot that's going to be absorbed by your skin. So like knowing a little bit more about the industry certainly, certainly helps. So I, I want to talk about fragrance because yeah. essential oils in this space is huge. I feel like people yeah. talk and really like promote, we only have our fragrances with essential oils. And I know you mm-hmm. have a stance on like we're just talking, like you don't need to only have essential oils. And in a lot of cases, essential oils aren't even produced sustainably or, you know, right. all that jazz. But I would love to hear your take more on that if you don't mind talking sure. about that. Sure. So if you remember from before, I was saying that I watched people buy shampoo and conditioner and f- the scent profile is so important to them, right? Like they're they're buying it based on scent. They're opening it. They're reading it based on scent. So I knew that I wanted to have a symphony of scents for my line. There was, that was something that was a hundred percent true for me. And with, when I first started, I naively was on the essential oils train, just like everyone else in sustainability. And, you know, I, it was a learning process for me too. But when I talked to my chemist and he was talking to me about, you know, Hey, I just want you to know that some of these essential oils, the way that they're produced is they're cold pressed with pesticides on them. And those pesticides, uh, because when, because think about like how much I'd say lavender you have to grow to get a drop of lavender oil, right? Think about how much biomass is used for that. That wasn't even, that's my, that was like the secondary conversation. But the first one was knowing like how much that all the, you know, the farming standards, you can't homogenize farming standards. Farming is like a dirty business. It's not clean. It's not like it's, it's, you know, you get the crops when you get the crops and, and it's weather dependent, it's land dependent, it's pesticide dependent. Um, and so 
I, when he was telling me that some of essential oils, especially when they be, become commodified and come from several different farms and grouped together, um, you can't, you don't know what's actually getting pressed into your essential oils. And so that to me is more frightening than um, a very clean. So then I go, I went over to Roberté, which is our fragrance manufacturer. They're like the globe, one of the global leaders in, in doing sustainable and clean fragrances. And so when I talked to them about it, we talked about, um, you know, definitely getting rid of the phthalates. That's like very, very important to me because those are the endocrine disruptors that really, um, that's like what gives people the, that horrible migraine from perfume, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and also, you know, just, just the disruption on your systems and your hormones. But um, when I, when I talked to Roberté, you know, they educated me even further. Like, yeah, we can, through the magic of science, we can take out the allergens that plants provide, you know, plants, a lot of plants are, shouldn't be left on the skin or the scalp. Like a lot of those oils, um, they're like, we can take out the allergens. We can make sure that every batch is homogenized and exactly the same. And they have some of the strictest, strictest, um, you know, manufacturing standards of anyone. So for me, it, it kind of the whole picture came together when I, when I learned all of those things. And you probably wouldn't learn those things if you weren't in the industry having these behind the scenes conversations. You know, it's, it's very, the marketing speak that's out there for the public is very different than what is happening in like the Society of Co Cosmetic Chemists or, you know, in Robertay's walls or in my own manufacturers with my own chemists. It's just a different style of conversation because you're not trying to convince anyone. You're actually talking in fact. And I'm trying to be kind to the essential oils market because there are small batch essential oils providers that do provide really beautiful essential oils. But if dip was ever to explode and I would need to source something like say, for example, and we're not, we don't have our eyes set on target, but say we wanted to go to target, say I needed like eucalyptus oil. Like I would have to buy so much that I wouldn't know where it came from anymore. That's the, the story cloud around why dip uses synthetic fragrance and why I think it's actually a sustainability story because we don't need the landmass. We don't need the cheap labor. We don't need... We're, we're not dependent on weather, any of those things, those those factors that make farming so um, unpredictable. You know what that reminds me of? Totally what? not shampoo related, but it reminds me of diamonds, like natural diamonds mm -hmm. versus lab grown. And like yeah. this weird stigma with lab grown diamonds, which is kind of a mm -hmm. whole other topic there, but it just reminds yeah. me of that whole argument. It's it's kind of like that. Think about Think about the work that goes into extracting these oils. Like it's a lot of work and labor. And, you know, you think about that if in the diamond or the, the gem community, it's, it's, it's a lot of work to get one to the people that, you know, are kind of scratching their heads a little bit. Like I understand why people don't like the word fragrance. I, I understand that. And I, I want to acknowledge that you're right. You should be very careful of the fragrances you put on or around yourself and your family. Like, for example, the the plug-in air fresheners, they're not phthalate free. Like make sure you know kind of the standards to which those fragrances are made. Candles too, like anything that you're breathing, like please, please, please just do a deeper dive on the fragrance. I think that's the most interesting thing because I did read something on fragrance that was, it's not regulated. So you can just put fragrance somewhere and somebody can say it's like a trade secret. It's regulated. There's rules for fragrance. However, if you put them under 1% on your formula, then you don't, this is the rule, the industry rule. If you put them okay. lower than 1% on your formula, you don't have to put the long list. And some fragrances and and even some of my own are lists of like 300 ingredients. So it would take up the whole box and wrap around the box. And that's why it's, it's very, it has much less to do with, with hiding and more to do with like surface area on a box. Oh, oh my gosh. Well, I hope that educated somebody cause that just educated me. <laughs> um, and of course some people are trying to hide stuff too, but like, I, I'm not trying to hide anything. I have like letters on our website that Robert says they're built to the cleanest standard. So yeah. Okay. So just do research on fragrance is the takeaway of that. Really. Yeah. Okay, I want to change the topic a little bit, going a little bit direction, different direction here, still on the topic of like marketing um, and greenwashing and things like that. You don't work with influencers at all. You don't send free product out. You don't do paid campaigns with any of them. And you have a very interesting stance on UGC as well, because that's not technically an influencer. UGC right. is a little bit different, but I know 
the line has gotten slightly blurry with TikTok coming into play and it becoming so popular to have UGC and influencers and all that stuff. So with that being yeah. said, I wanted to get your take on that as well. First of all, there are some influencers out there that I love so much. And just to shout them out, Doria, who's the earth stewardess, she is mm -hmm. amazing. She's incredible. Like she, she's an influencer that also is like a law changer in New Hampshire. And, you know, I would say you, you are now, you've now become a person of influence and it's like amazing, you know, it's, it, there's, there's something so genuine about the way you put yourself out there. Um, also Carissa and Alex that we worked with, they're all, they're incredible. Like they were strictly instructed not to influence. I didn't want them to go out and talk about how great dip was. Like, I didn't want that. I wanted them to make like fun videos on TikTok, and they did exactly that. And they were like amazing with influencers. I don't judge someone's value on follower count. I just don't think some people should pay for products and other people should not pay for products. I just don't like it. I find it hard to take someone's review seriously if they don't pay for it because I think paying for a product is part of the review because you had to go through the choice of I'm going to choose this product over all these other ones. You've departed with your money now and then your review becomes like real. Um, and I remember when you and I like first spoke, we, I think you, you would ask for product because it was again, UGC was kind of budding and new. And I, I said that I said the same thing. I was like, Oh, sorry, we don't do that. Cause I, I say no to everyone that asks for it. I get about just to put it in perspective, I get around 200 to 250 DMS or emails a day at the start of every day of people asking for free product. Wow. Every day I wake up to that. It doesn't even matter. It could be Christmas day. I'm waking up to these freaking emails of people asking me for food. I just like, I've stopped answering them, obviously. But, um, but what made your TikTok so compelling was that you said like, this isn't sponsored. Like I, this is like, this is a real review. And I think that's what, that was like what the magic was. And for me, like, I know it means for, for dip, it means we grow slower, but I want someone to have confidence when they see someone talking about dip to know that it's not, it's not paid for. Cause in the background, when you guys are consumer facing, right? I'm brand facing the emails I get, I've been getting for the past year are, and there's probably been four or five different agencies that have reached out to me saying this exact thing. We will hire out of work, attractive actors and actresses for UGC. That's a business. So capitalism has come and ruined UGC. It's made it so, so uh, phony, basically. And so you don't even know if this person saying that they love some something was even like in love with the brand before. Now, you know, now there's this thing in my, in the back of my brain. I was like, Oh, is this a paid out of work actor? Like, mm. is, this, is this what I'm watching now? And it's a shame because it destroys the well-meaning people that are doing really, really good work. Like there's mm. there, I mean, you know, there are so many people that, that put their heart and souls into like these videos for brands and they ha make like a beautiful living doing that. But now there's the sinister side of it where there's like this phony level of UGC where people will say anything. I know we've talked and you've almost called this like a social experiment. Like, can you yeah. build something without using social media in that way that has become so yeah. common to do now? Do you feel yeah. like it's worked? Yes. So it has worked. Um, I can support my family with Zip. I can now, my husband is now working with us and it's really fun. And like, it's a, it's, um, so I haven't run a single digital ad ever. Um, and we've never, you know, paid for someone to say that they like dip ever. Um, and yet it t continues to grow and it continues to grow in like a really beautiful way where like, sometimes I'm just overwhelmed by like the beautiful DMS people send to me. Um, you know, they've been looking for something for their their hair for a long time that like solved their problems or was more sustainable, or even they didn't even care about sustainability. They just like wanted something, you know, that made their hair look nice. Like, like there's, there's a lot of people that are sold, especially curly hair is they're sold so many products and they can replace most of them with dip. Um, so I, I feel like a nice sense of purpose um, building my company this way. Obviously, it's not like super, a super fast way to grow, but it's a way where I've been able to have like one-on-ones with my customers. And a few weeks ago, someone wrote, 
it was one of our first bad reviews ever. Like we don't get bad reviews, which is like so nice. Um, but she was like, I really wanted to like this and I just, it just didn't work for me. And I saw like on our reviews, you can see like what kind of hair someone has. Is it long, thick, curly, like all these, all these things. And um, I saw that she bought the minis, but she had like, she described it like having lots of volume and having like, you know, coarse curly hair. And so I wrote to her and I was like, hey, your review is so atypical. And I see that you really wanted to love the bars. Like, let me send you like a bigger set. I think you might have a different experience. And I just saw the other day she wrote, um, she wrote a really beautiful, nice review. and was like worth a second chance. Um, and she said it's like perfect and she loves it. And like, it's that kind of one-on-one -on -one with my customers that like if we ever grow I'm really gonna miss that when someone comes in the Shopify chat like it's it's me and I love I love answering them I you know and sometimes it's funny because people don't expect it to be like the owner that answers them they expect like an AI bot and they you know they, so they start really hard and like mean and then I'm like no no it's just me I'm like just I'm here <laughs> answering your stuff and then it it's all they always people always seem surprised that I'm on the other side of the phone but like I know how frustrating it is to try and get something done or get a question asked and like you just get bot answers back and you want to like mm. pull your own hair out. Um, and I know AI is really good, but it's not so good that like it, that you, that people are, are um, believing it. You know, I think after a few rounds, you like, you like, Oh, I'm in, I'm in a freaking bot circle again. I think the human element of everything is, is really important to the way I want to run my own business. I understand why people want to like, cast everything off, but I'm just not there yet. On your socials, I mean, we talked about UGC. You do have some people that aren't you, obviously, that post on your yeah. pages. So I just oh, yeah. want to clarify, I don't want you to come under fire and be like, what are oh, yeah. other people that aren't so, you on your social? Oh yeah, are I can tell you, I can tell you exactly who they are. So um, there's Carter. Carter uh, was a customer. I had a, I had a brand a few years ago. Carter has been a customer of mine for like several years, maybe like three or four years. And I saw that he was wanted to save for surgery and had to go fund me. And I was like, Hey, and he also has like this amazing rock and roll, like mullet that is, is different, vivid colors or whatever. And, um, I invited him to be, become part of the, part of the content team because I was like, you know, setting up a GoFundMe is slow, but I can pay you to make videos. He's there for, for vivid hair care. And I like, just love, I just like love this person. They're so great. And then um, Precious was someone actually, she was a UGC person that kept reaching out to me and I just ignored her for a long time and I feel really bad about it now. <laughs> um, but uh, she purchased the product and, but I, you know, because I get so many of these emails, I just like, and DMs, I like, I don't look at them anymore. Um, mm. And so she wrote this really beautiful letter about how much she loves dip and, you know, she's a mother and she, was so excited to find something for her type four hair that finally worked for her. And so eventually I was like, you know what? Like, yeah, let's do it. Let's get you on the feed. Let's, let's, you can absolutely make content. And I sent her bigger, she was using the minis too, which was like crazy that she loved it. Even the minis. I was like, go here are the big bars here, you know, here's the rack. Like, please, like, you know, teach me how you use the bars. And she's, she's been really amazing with that. And then the other person is Nico. Nico is also a customer of my, First brand and now a customer at this one. And I, I know her personally, but she um, is a surfer and has this like long, beautiful, wavy, cascading blonde hair. Like it's like the hair of my dreams. When Nico walks into a room, like I just, I like just see her hair and I just, I'm so envious and, and like enamored. I just like, I love her hair so much. Um, but she surfs almost every day and she'll even surf in the cold in New Jersey. And wow. um, she's been using dip forever. I have been like considering opening up to our customer base. Like if you can prove you're a customer of dip already, like then we can talk about content and figure out how that works. Um, Cause I don't want to shut the door on all these well-meaning people that do want to authentically create content. I think consumers are smart and I think they can tell when something is just like phone. I don't know. They can tell when something's phony, the UGC, like I just, or, or maybe I'm so jaded for having, having been in the beauty industry for so long. Like I can tell when something's just like pretend authenticity, you know? I know you know, because I think everyone knows. It's like when you look at an AI human face and you're like, something's not right about this, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's that same emotion where you're like, I don't think that this is like real. Um, and and it's one of the things I really struggle with on TikTok. Like it's become so commercialized that it's lost its kind of fun. 
for me anyway. Um, and I don't know, I don't know if it's ever going to go back to the, like, I loved 2020 TikTok. Mm -hmm. 2020 TikTok Mm -hmm. was so fun. Um, 2023 TikTok is like, it's like every human has become a commercial. Yeah. It does kind of feel like that, doesn't it? Maybe it's my page. I don't know. But I, what I really, I, I keep trying to follow comedians and they keep giving me people talking about bags, cups, and straws. And like, <laughs> I, I want, I want to keep following comedians. Like, I don't know how I get, how I get, like, I, I don't know how many times someone can recommend a freaking tote bag to me. Like I, I, I'm using tote bags. Like get me off tote bag TikTok. I don't know how to get off of it. <laughs> can you yeah. help me? <laughs> I don't know. I'm stuck there too. And I, I, think, like, I don't know what to do about it. It's like, you know, I see people do like lifestyle content and I love watching people's lives, but I think sometimes there's a bit of a blurry line where it feels like you're watching their life, but they're also trying to sell you something because a lot of the industry is kind of like affiliate links, like fast fashion yeah. affiliate links. And um, yeah. the more they sell, the more commission they make, which you know, I respect it. I respect the grind. You know, I get it. Me too. But, you know, it, sometimes it's tiring when you feel like every other post is, here's an affiliate link for this. Here's where I got the blah, blah, blah. And some people genuinely want to know, hey, where'd you get those wine glasses, for example? <laughs> other people just feel like they're being sold to, you know? Yeah. And I like- and I honestly, like, I know that that grind like that the influencing is a really it's a tough job like one of my really really dear friends is an amazon influencer and she does really really well and you know there's no piece of me that thinks that her job is not important you know what i mean like there's no piece of me that dehumanizes what influencers do right because i i I see it. I see that's the way she feeds her family and like that. And, and she's good at it. She's like really good at it. Um, and so if it ever confuses anyone when I'm liking an Amazon influencers, because I have like a harsh stance against Amazon on our site, but like, you know, if anyone sees this, because this is, this is a human that I have known since I was maybe like 13 years old and I really, really love her. And I would be a hypocrite to say that I didn't shop on Amazon. I do like, I try and minimize it as much as much as much as possible right but like i will be very real with people and let them know that like if i can't find something amazon is the is the only place where it exists like like um you know i needed like persian barbecue skewers i that's where i found them like i couldn't find them locally so anyway i i don't i don't want anyone to think that like because i try and push refilleries and want people to get like you know to to do a more sustainable lifestyle that i think anyone should be all in like it's just that's like a ridiculous thing to ask someone to do yeah i agree i think you know some people kind of you know they can get angry in comments or something and say like why are you flying on an airplane or you know whatever whatever it might be why are you shopping on amazon whatever yeah and it's just really, really unrealistic to expect somebody to stop doing what's normal in today's society. So I'm sure there are people listening who feel like really inspired by your story and maybe they have an idea for something that's missing that they want to start. If you had one piece of advice for someone who's interested in a similar career path, what would you tell them? I would tell them one, number one is do it yourself. Like don't, find a partner to do it with. That was the first, that was the mistake I made with my first business. Can't talk about it too much. However, it was one of the biggest mistakes of my life was life was taking a partner. So I would say do it yourself because no one is going to like care about your business as much as you do. And you know, when it's your idea and your passion, that is something you can't transfer or share. It just isn't. Um, so make sure you, whatever it is that you're passionate about, that you want to build, that you are comfortable going that road alone for a little bit. And I will say the best book that I ever read um, on entrepreneurship is called A Company of One. Um, And it talks about how like you don't need to have all these pressures to grow and have like a mega corporation. That's like why I'm so comfortable having dipped like where it is. It's like such a beautiful place where it is right now where like I love getting up in the morning and running it and you know besides 200 emails like the rest of it is great you know um, like this this morning I just sent five thousand dollars over to Surfrider um because I I truly believe in what they're doing I I sponsor stuff all the time you know like even when your video went viral 
I made sure to take care of the charity that you were. It was SNPSA, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, when I sent the money over to SNPSA, it was, you know, $1,111 and 11 cents. Mm-hmm. And it was like such a fun check. That was like my first like big check to give to a charity. It was the, the biggest one at the time. Um, but I'm able to, when you run something by yourself, you don't have to ask anyone, Hey, I care about this place so much. Like I want to just send over a thousand dollars and not have anyone to answer to. I, I love doing it by myself and making sure that that my passion kind of can go where exactly where I want it to. And so if someone else is starting something like, you know, figure out what it is you're trying to solve and then figure out everything you can about it. Like my, the most fun part of um, starting dip was reading every bad review of every single other bar brand out there. I was like, these are the problems I'm going to solve. I don't like when people glamorize entrepreneurship because it's not easy and it's not it requires a lot of things that you might have to learn by accident, like taxes and trademarks and patents and like all these other things that are like really expensive mistakes to not know ahead of time. Insurance, business insurance, getting the right business insurance. You're right. Like it's, <laughs> I, don't, I wouldn't say this life is for everyone. I think there are mm-hmm. so many days where I'm like, man, if I just worked a nine to five and had great insurance and benefits, like maybe that would be worth it to get, like go back to that. But then I think about, I'm so passionate about doing this and I'd have to give up this. Something I would like to tell the audience that they might like, they might not consider about entrepreneurship. So I, when I started dip, I was 120 pounds. And then that, and then 18 months later, I was 180. Um, So the stress of starting it, like, the, so was, we're going, we're going to talk about cortisol, right? Like this, the actual hormone of stress was so bad. Like I'm enjoying it now, but I'm telling you like before it was just not that fun to build, even though I love creating and stuff. It's, it's very stressful to like, not know whether you're going to sell or whatever. Like I put on 60 pounds and it, I went to the doctor maybe like three months ago. Cause I was like, why am I putting on weight? Like I'm running, I'm eating, I haven't touched a carb or a banana in like six years. Like what is going on? And my stress levels were like way off the charts. And they're like, yeah, it doesn't matter what you do because you you are in a high stress zone. Um, and I think that's a weird thing about entrepreneurship that no one prepared me for, because had I known that stress could have been a factor, I would have gone, I would have talked to my doctor about, I kept going to the doctor and they were like, exercise more and eat less. And I was like, okay, but like, it's something else now because I'm trying to hack this. Like I, you know, I ran like 10 half marathons that year and I still was putting on, I was like blowing up, like, and I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. And so if anyone is hearing this and they don't, and and they suddenly they don't feel like themselves, you know, I was like just awake from between one and four in the morning every day, every day. Like I just was awake. And, uh, and then, you know, those are all classic signs of high stress that I just didn't know about. It was actually the best thing about it. I got on stress TikTok that helped me learn what to do. Like I got off bags TikTok for a while, tote bag TikTok, and went into like high cortisol TikTok. And that was actually <laughs> very helpful. <laughs> that was one of those things that was like, oh, okay, I guess my medicine is I have to I have to switch from running to doing long walks, which like if you're like an intense person, a walk it doesn't cut it. <laughs> I wanted to do like these long intense runs, but I couldn't do them anymore because they were like, oh that's going to contribute to your stress. So, so I had to like learn, relearn how to like decompress and, and live again. Um, and so, yeah, anyone starting a business, if you're like, I didn't even know I was prone to high stress, but like, it is a very real thing. I, I just couldn't believe it. Like I couldn't understand what was happening to me. Yeah. It's, it's weird. The things you learn as you get older and you're like, why don't, why don't more people talk about this? It's so weird. Yeah. That was, a, that was a, a big lesson to learn about just having a business is like, you have to, you have to do the decompressed stuff. Um, you can't live in like the, the muck of it all the time. Well, Kate, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Is there anything else you wanted to bring up while we're here? No, I mean, if you're, if you're curious about dip, if anyone is listening and is curious about it, it is me in the Shopify chat. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And um, yeah, I hope, I hope you guys liked this episode. You can find uh, Dip at dipalready.com and you can find it in around 215 uh, small stores around the country. 
Um, I prefer that you shop there first. These small stores need need our help and they need people walking in. And hopefully if you walk into one of those stores and it's a refill store, you can find something else that piques your interest that you can buy too. And don't look for me because all of my stuff is private. You can find me on LinkedIn, I guess. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> <laughs> um, or you can find me in any of the DMs uh, on our on the dip socials I'm there I will link all the dip socials and website all that information in the show notes of the podcast for anybody interested along with some of the other things we talked about in this episode and Kate thank you so much for being on I really appreciated it I hope our conversation resonates with somebody listening today I think it will yeah. uh, the feeling is mutual my friend Hey, we have made it to the good climate news section. Today's good climate news is not an article per se, but it is actually an up and coming like cool technology um, or like I guess product. So it is a coffee cup, but no, it is not like a reusable coffee cup that you would get like, you know, and keep in your cup, like cupboard at home. Instead, it is meant for to go coffees like you would pick up at like Starbucks or wherever your local coffee shop goes. So I want you to picture a hot coffee cup. When you look on the inside, it's shiny. That shiny stuff is typically plastic. So you can't like recycle the cup after you're done with it. It usually just gets thrown away and goes to a landfill. Plus there's like that plastic lid on top and normally you can't really recycle that either because it's complicated. This new cup is called the good cup and the edges actually fold down and they snap into place. So you don't need a plastic lid for it at all, reducing your plastic consumption. And the cup is fully recyclable and compostable. It's definitely worth clicking the link and at least just like checking out. It's like the picture of the cup is right at the top. I think it looks really cool. Um, anyways, I think that this is super cool and I hope this becomes a little bit more mainstream and we start seeing people use these types of cups instead of the ones with all the plastic on the inside that just goes to a landfill. So I think it's cool. I'll link it in the show notes for anybody interested in checking it out. And that is this week's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. A few things I want to bring up here at the end if you have made it this far. If you are interested in learning more about greenwashing, I have my free greenwashing guide downloadable on the website. I will link that below. And I also have a monthly newsletter. Um, the one for July actually just went out. So you just missed that one, but you can get on the list for the next month, which is August. You can get on the list for August. I try to keep them fun and light. It's only once a month. And I like to, you know, provide a little bit of everything, some climate, some health and wellness, some mental health stuff, and a little section on just, you know, kind of whatever's on my mind for that month. So thank you so much for being a part of this episode. I'd love to have you guys here. If you feel like it, would love to have um, your thoughts and ratings on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you get a moment, that would mean a lot to me. Really helps out the podcast. And love you guys. See you next week, Monday, 7 a.m. sharp. Sure.